Paul Moore here with Bigger Pockets. So excited to be with you today. And today we're going to be talking about how to turn $100,000 into $4 million or more by investing in commercial real estate. So welcome. I'm glad you're here. Hey, do me a favor. If you can hear me, let me know. I need to know if you can hear me. Hey, let me know where you're from as well. Hey, Vernita. Hey, Paul. Hey, Joshua. Jerry, great to meet you. Glad you are here. Uh, we're coming to you from Bigger Pockets Live, Facebook Live, and YouTube Live. Thank you, Jeremiah. Okay, so let me finish getting set up here and we will rock and roll. So, so excited that you're joining me here tonight. We're going to talk about how to turn $100,000 into $4 million in commercial real estate. And you may think that sounds ridiculous, Robert Barrett from Dallas, or Lavise or Kenny Yapile, or Ryan from Louisville, Timberman Land from Myrtle Beach. Hey, I know people in Timber. But I'm going to tell you that it's actually possible, and I'm going to tell you the exact steps how to do it. But First of all, tell me where you're from. Hey, Jimmy from Southern California, Myrtle Beach. Okay, Mark from Toronto, Arfon. Hey, from Happy Lung from Toronto. Somebody else from Toronto, that's awesome. Okay, so what we're gonna do, uh-oh, Adam, you said you lost your sound. I hope you can hear me. Can everybody else hear me? Hey, Scott from Little Rock, Dallas, Charleston. Okay, we got a big crowd tonight. So what we're gonna do, is I'm going to give you an overview on how other people are turning $100,000 into $4 million or more using the commercial real estate asset class. Now you may wonder, hey, Paul, how can I turn $100,000 into $4 million? We'll start with $4 million and then, that's a joke, sorry, it's not even funny. Um, Hey, so seriously, uh, we're going to talk about this in a minute. But first, let's talk about 10 reasons not to invest in real estate. Okay, reason number one not to invest in real estate. Trading stocks reminds you of trading Beanie Babies, which you were definitely not crazy about, nor did you have a closet full of them. <laughs> number two reason not to invest in real estate. You would hate it if you got a deposit of cash in your account for doing nothing. Number three reason not to invest in real estate. You like the control of investing in stocks and being able to personally and directly influence the price of Google or Apple. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, number four, you like to be able to call up the CEOs directly to ask about your stock values. Number five, you like knowing that the moment you stop working, you'll stop making money. Number six reason not to invest in real estate. What if your tenant's toilet breaks? You'd have to fix it yourself because you're the only person in the world who knows how to fix toilets. Number seven reason, everyone else seems to be investing in stocks and you like to follow the crowd. Number eight reason not to invest in real estate. The government seems full of nice, hardworking people who are doing a stellar job and you want to be sure to pay your fair share in taxes. Number nine, you want to use... You want all your money in one account because you can only remember a single username and password. And number 10, reason not to invest in real estate. People may suddenly decide they don't need roofs over their heads or indoor plumbing or modern appliances. Hey, okay. Hey, I want to thank my friends Annie and Julie over at Good Egg Investments. Check them out. Good Egg Investments. They gave me these top 10 reasons for why you shouldn't invest in commercial or other type of real estate. And somebody got it. Thank you, Eric. You actually got the joke. Okay, seriously, we're going to talk tonight about how to invest $100,000 and turn it into $4 million, actually more than that, in commercial real estate. And I'll get back to that in a second. First of all, I want to thank Bigger Pockets for putting on the first national conference. Uh, if you haven't signed up yet, it's going to be in Nashville, Tennessee at the Gaylord Opryland Hotel. And you can invest a little bit of your time. One of the great articles that came out in Bigger Pockets this week was real estate is overheated, invest here instead. Thank you, Enrique. And uh, that article says you should invest in yourself. 
Warren Buffett said, what's the greatest investment opportunity on this planet? He said, invest in yourself. So invest in yourself. Come to the Bigger Pockets Conference. I'll be speaking there. Brandon Turner will be there. Others will be there. Matt Faircloth. Lots of great folks. Dave, folks, David Green, Mindy Jensen. Uh, great crew will be speaking at the Bigger Pockets Conference October 6th through 8th. Please enjoy that with me and please come up to me and say hi also love to encourage you to enjoy to join bigger pockets pro we'll talk a little more about that later so how can you take a hundred thousand dollars and invest in real estate you probably think well i'm gonna have to build up a massive massive uh portfolio of um single family homes I'm going to have to fix toilets and I'm going to have to not hire a property manager and I'm going to have to do all kinds of things I hate. But at the end of the day, when I'm 80 years old, I'll finally have made my goal. And I'm going to actually recommend that you consider a strategy that I'm probably not going to get a lot of happy people from. By the way, if you are happy right now, please give me a thumbs up, a like, or a share so Bigger Pockets doesn't fire me before the conference. Um, seriously, would love to get a little thumbs up from you to tell Facebook and YouTube and everybody that you like what Bigger Pockets is doing. Thank you so much, Johnny. All right. So, um, let's talk about commercial real estate. Now, if you're investing in residential real estate, you are in a situation where your value is based on comps. That means if you're Chip and Joanna Gaines Jr., and you might be, um, you can take a $300,000 house in a $300,000 neighborhood, buy it for two fifty, dollars and add not $50,000, but add half a million dollars in improvements. Put in gold-plated fixtures, finish the attic, build out the back, finish the basement, add you know all kinds of beautiful fixtures and everything else, and you've got $800,000 in it. Well, you probably know this, folks. You're not gonna get $800,000 out of it. In fact, you'll probably get more like $300,000 out of it because residential real estate is based on comps comparable properties. It's based on the other properties in the neighborhood and you're not going to get a whole lot more than that. Now, commercial real estate's very different. Commercial real estate is based on a value formula, which we're going to go over. And if you're going to take notes, this would be the one technical thing you want to take notes on. So grab a pen. Uh, commercial real estate, you can actually force appreciation. And this is why people like Brandon Turner have jumped from residential into commercial real estate. And when I say commercial real estate, I don't just mean office buildings and retail and malls. Uh, I mean any larger scale real estate. So that can be multifamily of, you know, five units or above. Technically, is considered small commercial. Mainline commercial multifamily is like 80 units or above. I'm thinking of self-storage. I'm thinking about mobile home parks. I'm thinking about senior living facilities and others. So if you are investing in commercial real estate, your actual value of the property is going to be based on a value formula. The value formula is value equals net operating income divided by rate of return. Now, more specifically, it's the net operating income, the income from operations, not including the debt service, divided by the cap rate. Now the cap rate's also known as the capitalization rate, and that is the rate of return that a typical investor expects to get for this type of asset in this market at this time. And your cap rate used to be running eight, nine, 10% on average. Right now with lower interest rates and the extreme demand for real estate, it's running more on the order of about um, four and a half to six and a half percent these days. You can sometimes get a seven or eight percent cap rate, but it's hard. And if you hold on till the end of the show, I'll tell you how you can actually do that. But anyway, it's the net operating income divided by the rate of return. So if you can increase the numerator, and decrease or compress the denominator, you can actually dramatically affect value. And if you use leverage, safe leverage, hopefully, you can actually increase the value of your equity even more. Okay, 
So I'm going to go through three examples, and then I'm going to tell you how you can turn $100,000 into $5 million, $4 million at least, in commercial real estate. So let's talk about a mobile home part. Now, these are theoretical numbers. They're actually based on all real examples that I'm very familiar with. My company, Wellings Capital, invests in self-storage, mobile home parks, and a little bit of multifamily. And so these are taken from real examples, but um, I'm trying to keep it a little bit theoretical right now because I don't want to get in any trouble for advertising something that you know that that doesn't happen because the economy can change things can change cap rates can change interest rates can change and between now and the time of sale of the property the whole situation could be different than it is now but let's take a mobile home park that was purchased for five million dollars okay five million dollar purchase price and that would be based on a 60 percent loan to value ratio you would have uh, three million dollars in debt and two million dollars in equity okay three million in debt two million in equity 60 percent loan to value ratio i think we'd all agree that's fairly safe uh, for most properties and two million dollars in cash put into it from investors from like a syndication or your own cash okay got that all right now this operator went in there the asset manager went in after closing and he said wow there are work trailers and boats and rvs everywhere and some of these mobile homes have three or four or five or six cars parked out front some of them are on jacks we're going to have to fix and clean up this place so he said okay we're going to take an acre of land out front near the front of the mobile home park and we're going to pave it and then we're going to put a nice fence around it and a nice gate with a keypad and everybody who has a boat or an RV or a work trailer or a fifth or sixth car has to park it in there in the future. And we're going to charge rent for that. Not a whole lot, but we're going to charge rent. And then when that's all filled up with the park people, we're going to go out to the community and advertise on Craigslist. And we're going to advertise, um, uh, we're going to advertise the opportunity for boat or RV storage. And so that's what they're doing. Now, it only costs $100,000 to pave that area. Okay, remember, it's a $5 million purchase price. They just spent $100,000 on this paving and fencing. When this is full, this lot for storage is going to be able to be rented at $10,000 a month. Now, do the math. It's starting to sound pretty good. Uh, $10,000 a month is $120,000 a year. My mom always said I was good at math. And $120,000 a year is the increase in net operating income, okay? So remember our value formula. Value is net operating income divided by cap rate. $120,000 in net operating income divided by a, an average cap rate of about 6%. It could be better than that, by the way. You know, it's better for the owner. But 6% cap rate, 120,000 divided by 0 0.06 is, hope that came out like a drum roll, $2 million. $2 million increased value. That's a 40% increase in value of this asset. But it's better than that because remember there was only $2 million in equity. And so that equity just went up from $2 million. The bankers got none of this increase. And the bank, the equity went up from two million to four million. The equity was doubled, so doubling our equity with one change in this park. But wait a minute, they're they're doing all kinds of other things. They're raising occupancy. They're raising rents a little bit, not too much. Uh, they're bringing in uh, decks and and sheds, and they're they're renting carports. They're, they're doing other things. They're, they're passing back the utilities um, to the uh, tenants and they're doing different things to raise income. But that one change brought about 100%, at least on paper, increase in the equity value. Wow, that's pretty powerful. But there's lots of other things that can be done. Take a self-storage facility. Uh, imagine you are going into a self-storage facility. A typical mom and pop facility has maybe occupancy of 70 or 80 percent and the rents are maybe 25 percent below market. Now if you can raise the rents by 20 percent, let's say, 
you are increasing the income instantly by 20%, okay? Now, if you can also raise occupancy by 10%, you're raising the income by another 10% compounded on top of that 20. So that's like 30, 32% increase in income from raising the occupancy and the rent. Now, let's say you're also adding ancillary stuff, like you're selling locks, boxes, tape, scissors, uh, you're charging late fees, you're uh, charging an admin fee. Now you've raised the rates by an additional 5%, your income by 5%. Now you're up to 37% increase. And let's say on top of all that, you start a U-Haul operation there. It's very easy to do. And you add another $3,000 a month to your income. Let's say that's another 8%. And now I lost track of where I was. I think that puts us up to a 45% increase in net operating income. That's a 45% increase in the value of the facility. That's not including a whole lot of other things you can do, like building a new climate control building, which is even better than that. But 45% increase in income with very, very little money spent out of pocket. These are mostly operational and management changes. Okay, that sounds really great. 45% increase in income is a 45% increase in value. But that's not all you get, folks. You actually get an increase in equity that's multiplied by the leverage that you put in. So if your leverage is 60%, that means you're dividing by 1 minus 0.6 or you're basically multiplying by two and a half times. So 45% increase in value of the asset, multiply that by two and a half times, and that is something like over 100% increase in equity. So the equity holders, the people who invested in the steel, if those operational changes were made, would have an over 100% increase in the value of their equity through appreciation that doesn't include the cash flow that's pretty powerful folks so what i'm saying is commercial real estate has an opportunity to force appreciation and dramatically increase the equity one more example okay now this is a little harder to get your arms around so listen up if you can compress the cap rate that has a dramatic impact on the value as well so let's say for this example, you are going in and you're making this into a professional operation. You're turning it from a mom and pop, kind of a podunk place into a beautifully run, uh, well-oiled machine with systems and procedures and policies and a beautiful logo and a website. And of course, with all that, you're gonna dramatically increase the income. But I'm not arguing that right now. I'm saying, let's just assume you keep the income the same. Now remember our commercial real estate value formula. Value is net operating income divided by the cap rate. Now if you can increase a professional, if you can make your operation into a professional operation and sell to a REIT, like a real estate investment trust or life insurance company or a private equity group, you can dramatically compress the cap rate. So let's say you buy it as seven cap. 7% rate of return, 7% capitalization rate, seven cap. If you can compress that to the buyer to a 5.4% cap rate, and folks, I'm using 5.4 for a reason because a lot of deals that we've invested in recently with an operator we've invested in, they've been getting about 5.4% average on the sale of the last 21 assets on average. They've been busy. 5.4% cap rate, last I checked. If you can go from a 7 to a 5.4% cap rate, you can do the math on this, holding the income constant, that's a 28% increase in asset value. Meaning that if you can go in, make this a professional operation, you can turn it into a, you can increase the asset value by 28% by finding the right buyer. But remember our friend leverage. Leverage at 60% means you're dividing by 0.4% or multiplying by 2.5x. 28% increase in value times 2.5x 
is something like 60 or 70 percent increase in equity you got 70 percent for perhaps equity appreciation by this one move of compressing the cap rate now what if you could do several of these well this is exactly what a lot of capital of commercial real estate investors are doing these days and this is one of the reasons the forbes 400 the wealthiest people in america invest in commercial real estate because a great operator with a great acquisition strategy and a great pool to sell to can actually do these kind of maneuvers in fact we are seeing wellings capital my company is investing with three or four operators who are doing this type of thing routinely one of them has an average if you're familiar with irr internal rate of return their average annual return irr uh, in this case is literally over 63 percent and that's documented by a third party 63 percent return annually okay another one of the operators has a return to investors of about 43 or 44 percent and that's the one i just told you about a minute ago another operator is in the 20 25 percent range okay now assume you had a fund or a mixture of several of these assets and you were averaging again historically speaking you could be averaging over 40 percent annual return from investing in these types of assets now i'm going to take that number and cut it in half for our illustration here assume you could actually get a 20 percent return now 20 percent return under lots of standards is insanely high by the way that's a simple return it's not compounded annually okay buffett has averaged warren buffett has averaged 19 percent annually but that's a compounded rate of return and so that makes a huge huge difference but 20 percent simple rate of return assume that and let's assume your strategy is to refinance every six years okay by the way a lot of the operators we've invested with have gotten these massive returns i just told you and they've been able to refinance or sell these assets every one of them 2.7 years on average another about three years on average okay but let's say it takes let's say your annual return is half as much as they've been getting like 20 percent and let's say it takes twice as long to churn an asset in other words sell it or refinance it let's say it takes six years instead of three i'm trying to be conservative folks okay so if you i, I told you at the beginning of the show and the title of the show was how to take a hundred thousand dollars and turn it into four million dollars well if you took a hundred thousand dollars and invested it now and you were able to get these returns that i'm talking about and you know i don't have to disclaim this because it's obvious that you might not be able to get these type of returns or if you were investing historically with these guys you'd be getting much better returns if you invested a hundred thousand dollars and you reinvested all of your distributions along the way assuming uh, an average annual cash flow of two percent the first year six the second ten the third twelve the fourth eight percent every year after that um, let's say you were assuming that you were going to um, you were going to refinance the asset and give you all your principal back in six years like i said you could do it in less than that at the end of six years if you re if you read invested all the profits along the way your hundred thousand would turn into two hundred and twenty thousand one hundred eighty one dollars using my assumptions okay now you either sell or refinance them and now you take that two hundred twenty thousand reinvest it you do it another six year cycle that turns into double that what a surprise four hundred eighty four thousand now we're at year 12. okay now you do it again from year 12 to 18 and that turns into a higher number of 1.067 million okay 1.067 that was more than double the first time by the way and that time as well now you do it again for another cycle from year 19 to 24 it turns into 2.349 million and by the way you're using 1031s exchanges charles thank you all along the way i'm assuming no taxes paid along the way that's perhaps a bad assumption and if you go another six-year cycle up to year 30 your total 
including all the reinvestment of dividends, including no capital gains taxes along the way, is $5.171 million. Folks, this is simple math. I've got a spreadsheet here to prove it. And I can share the spreadsheet maybe if you ask me. You have to go to my Bigger Pockets profile to ask me about that. Okay, now if you had to pay capital gains taxes along the way, and let's just say there were no state taxes, but you were paying 15% capital gains at every six year increment, it's going to dramatically chop down your returns from 5.171 million down to 3.985 million. And folks, there it is. $100,000 turns into rounded off about $4 million in 30 years. Now, I didn't say it would be fast. I didn't say it would be easy. I didn't say there wouldn't be hard times along the way, but it is possible that you could do this. And this is why people who have a lot of money invest in commercial real estate. So I'm going to take a quick drink of water here, and I'm going to try to get to your questions. Now, if you've put in a question on Facebook, I'm going to need you to copy and paste uh, and put it in again if I don't get to you because my Facebook feed just drops the questions off after about five. YouTube, I'll do my very, very best to get to as many of your questions as I can. There's a lot of them, and I really do appreciate this. By the way, if you want to learn how to save on capital gains taxes without doing a 1031 exchange, we're making a recording tonight on how to do that. There are about five different ways, including opportunity zones, deferred sales trusts, um, installment sales, 721 exchange, and a 1031 exchange. So we can talk about that. I've got two tax webinars I'll share with you if you want to reach out to me at Bigger Pockets. So, hey, Abraham from Atlanta. Asim, where do I find such deals? That's the hardest part for you and everybody. Okay. I don't have 20 minutes to do this whole thing right, but I'll tell you, Asim, the best way to do this, thanks, Robert, that was nice of you to say, the best way to find these deals, Asim and everybody, is to find a fractured ownership base, okay? I'm gonna do this really quick. There are 44,000 mobile home parks in the US. About 39,000 or more are owned by mom and pop owners, okay? Many of them, most of them are probably not that well run and they can be acquired and upgraded like we talked about. Self-storage, there are about 53,000 self-storage facilities in the U.S. Um, that's as many as Subway, McDonald's, and Starbucks, by the way, combined. But of the 53,000, well over 30, possibly up to 40,000 are run by small operators. A lot of those are mom and pops and they cannot um, maximize, nor do they care to maximize their profits. They don't know how, they, they can't. And so what happens is you can acquire some of these, pay them a really good price, by the way, and you can do the changes I just mentioned. Now, my company, Wellings Capital, this is what we invest in, and these are the type of reasons that we love fragmented ownership, Asim, because uh, the owners the owners of these properties don't care to, or they don't know how to, or they don't have the resources they, uh, to upgrade these properties. Their attitude is, hey, if you build it, they will come. And they did for years. They don't even have websites, lots of them. I've got story after story of how this works, and it is possible. I took a long time to answer Asim's question because that's the most important question that any of you should be asking is, how do you find deals like this? By the way, if you're in a day job, you can do what I said. I just talked to a doctor yesterday who doesn't want to quit his job. He doesn't want to quit making his, you know, two, three hundred thousand, I would guess, per year. He can do this uh, with passive by passively investing a hundred thousand dollars or hopefully a hundred thousand a year, maybe. And maybe you're in a position to do that as well. Now, if you want to do it actively, you need to get involved with a syndication and that's where you raise money from other investors. And our friends over at Good Egg Investments, Julie, and um, their team are actually teaching people to do that. And there's other people that teach you to raise money for syndications as well. Alex Anderson says, biggest challenges when creating value 
add for multifamily. Alex, the biggest challenge is 93% of multifamily over 50 units right now are owned by corporations and they've already wrung out most of the value. And it's really, really hard to find upgrades that are meaningful to allow you to get a great return in multifamily. I wrote a book called The Perfect Investment. Not arrogant title, right? And um, it's about multifamily investing. It talks about how to wring out all the profits you can out of multifamily. There's a better book on multifamily. Uh, it's by Steve Burgess, B-E-R-G-E-S, The Complete guide to buying and selling apartment buildings you can get my book or steve's on amazon and i don't know steve but he wrote a great book sharik says what kind of cash on cash returns do you recommend to aim for and which asset class sharik you know i really wouldn't want to see for i wouldn't want you know buffett warren buffett talks about having a margin of safety if you aim for eight percent you might end up with six or seven and if there's a downturn or a softening in rents, you might end up with less. So I wouldn't aim for anything less than 8%. Um, in apartments right now, that's really hard to get. In self-storage and mobile home parks, it's, you know, again, from buying from the right uh, seller, it's not at all that hard to get. And so I would recommend 8% or more, maybe a little more with margin of safety. Okay, Isaac. Harris says, what resource do you recommend for raising funds for syndication? Um, so there are some really good tr people who train you how to raise money for syndication. I was trained by a company called 37th Parallel. And um, you can reach out to me on Bigger Pockets, and I will make a personal introduction to their CEO. Uh, there's also Good Egg Investments, which I mentioned already. And they train people in this. And there are other people who will train you. There's great books out there. My favorite book is Pitch Anything by Oren Claff. I don't recommend every single thing he says. Uh, that's my favorite book. Up until recently, my good friend Matt Faircloth wrote Raising Capital for Your Real Estate Deals. And Matt Faircloth wrote that book. And you should check that out. It's on the Bigger Pockets bookstore. And I highly recommend you check that out. Asim says, how do I watch a recording of this whole video? It's going to be published right after this is over. Thanks, Asim. Zidu G says, can you post the link about the book and is it available in Kindle? Um, I'm sorry, I pronounced your name wrong. Zudu, um, you can get it on Amazon.com. It's, um, I'm laughing because I said .com. Uh, <clears throat> it's called The Perfect Investment. You can reach out to me at wellingscapital.com or you can um, actually uh, get it on Kindle, as you said. Uh, DBS student says, I own a 25 unit mobile home park, no loans. Wow, good job. I own a 25% share selling for $400,000 right outside the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. Okay, so if somebody wants to reach out to DBS student, he can find out more. Lars28, if someone has $100,000 to lend, can we contact your group to fund your projects? That's really nice, Lars. Um, you know, reach out to us. Again, I'm Paul Moore, and I'm on Bigger Pockets, and you can uh, check it out there. You're welcome to, in, uh, you know, to contact me there. OG's oh, Fish Room, hello from New York. Sophie says, great video. Thank you. That's so kind of you. Um, this doesn't help anyone who wants to start with $100,000, says Joe. Hey, Joe, um, that may be true. Uh, can you elaborate on what you're saying there? I, I get it, um, but you're, you're t okay, I see what you're saying. You said thumbs down because you can't get to a two or $5 million property. Joe, yeah, you can. Um, I have myself. And I know lots and lots of people who invested $50,000 and they're part of a syndication that joins together. And I wasn't going to talk a lot about that, but I highly recommend that some of you guys pool your money together and invest together in a group. Thanks, DBS. Um, Chi says, uh, hi, I'd love to know your best guess for someone starting with lower startup costs. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? I'd really appreciate that. Um, Thanks, Sophie. Okay, AJ, AG says, just entered. Is he talking about syndication? Yeah, I'm often talking about syndication and being a professional operator. Uh, Sam says, that's great, but you're starting with $2 million of capital and adding 100000 in CapEx to increase it. 
you're not starting with 100,000 cash. Yes, Sam, that's where a syndication comes in. You want to be part of a group where you may have 20 people putting in 100,000 each or 21 in this case to get to 2.1 million. Great question. Thank you. And um, Joe, thank you for your comment. I really appreciate you keeping me honest here, man. Alex says, if you can't find good deals of multifamily in your area is building and creating a new multifamily, a good option. Alex, yeah. Uh, right down the road from me, somebody just built a fourplex for students at Liberty University in Lynchburg. Um, so yes, I would consider that for sure. Uh, Sanjay Baje says, I have invested in duplex properties in California. How many of them do you recommend selling using a 1031 exchange? In exchanging for a multifamily, uh, I don't want to be over leveraged, but I certainly want to take advantage of low interest rates. Sanjay, I, you know, I don't know. It like depends on the value. I mean, if you can invest, if you can get out of Californian investments and into the heartland of the U.S., you might be able to trade a four cap, a four percent cap rate investment, which is really expensive, for a six percent cap rate. Let's say in Kansas City, I made that up because it's in the middle of the country. And in that case, you're buying, you're selling high and you're buying low, okay? And that might be a good thing to do. By the way, that's one of the reasons I really like the Deferred Sales Trust. And if you want a copy of our video talking about why the Deferred Sales Trust works so well, then you can get that by contacting me at Bigger Pockets. Again, I'm Paul Moore. JM says, I have the cash. I just have trouble finding the multifamily properties. Man, me too. We're all having trouble. There's seven reasons we've identified multifamily is overheated. And I could go through these if a, you know, two or three of you ask me, but it's not that important. The point is they're definitely overheated right now. Now, five years from now, maybe we'll think today was cheap because maybe it's going to go up more. Maybe interest rates will go negative. Who knows? Jeremy Butler says, I learned a lot from this. Thank you. Closing on my first 40 unit. Thumbs up to Jeremy Butler. Great job, man. Closing on Friday. Thrilla Juice says, what do you recommend for someone who's never invested? Where should I set my sights? Um, you know, maybe get educated. You're in the right place here on Bigger Pockets. Bigger Pockets is the perfect place to learn about investing without the hype. And if you haven't got a Bigger Pockets Pro membership, I would recommend that you join me and my uh, friends here, Danny Ramos and others, and, and join, get become a Bigger Pockets Pro member where you can get all kinds of inside information, contracts, legal stuff, discounts, all kinds of stuff. It's the best investment I have ever made in my almost 30 years as an entrepreneur. Tra Thornton says, can you do this through Roth IRAs? Absolutely, yes, you can. Uh, JM, do you mentor? JM, I am actually setting up a mentoring group and it's not going to be a long-term mentoring process. Um, I don't do, you know, training and education, but I am going to take on like two or three mentor students. I'm actually making a decision on that this week on who that'll be. If anybody's interested in applying, again, you can contact me at Bigger Pockets on my profile or at my website, wellingscapital.com. Jiffy7 says, what do you think about crowdfunding sites such as Fundrise and Realty Mogul as a way to invest in commercial property? Folks, and DBS says, I wonder how I could get in a syndication. Well, there's your answer, uh, crowdfunding. Folks, you can crowdfund and you can get involved in some of these great deals. Uh, often you have to be an accredited investor, but, um, you can get involved in a lot of these great deals that used to be reserved for just the super wealthy. The Jobs Act uh, that was passed under the Obama administration, plus the Tax Reform Act that was passed under the Trump administration, combined together are making real estate investing the most powerful and now finally accessible asset class that I know of on the planet. And so... Um, yeah, I really do like the crowdfunding websites. Warning, Will Robinson. It, you can't guarantee that just because they're on a crowdfunding site, it's a good deal. Uh, there are websites uh, that there are crowdfunding sites where people have lost money just like anywhere else. It can happen. It can happen to you. It can happen to me. It can happen 
to anybody on any site is not a guarantee, but crowdfunding sites are a great place to access a lot of good deals. Please do your own due diligence though, okay? Rayma says, if you had $100,000, would you try to find a storage unit operator to get these returns? Or would you try to purchase your own? Great question. Matt says storage is very profitable, yeah. Um, Rima, unless you know self-storage really, really well, and I would presume that almost everybody on here doesn't, um, I would recommend joining together with somebody else. Scott Myers has a, probably five times a year, he does this wonderful uh, mentoring program for self-storage, and I have a potential discount on that. Uh, I know how to get if you want to reach out to me on bigger pockets. The problem is he just finished one of his web seminars like yesterday or the day before. So he'd probably be doing another one soon. I do recommend you join together, Rima, with others. Invest with a great operator or invest in a great fund or partner together with others who know what they're doing. I wrote a book on self-storage. It's not published yet, but I wouldn't go out Rima and do my own self-storage uh, or mobile home park, I would definitely partner together with other people who know more about it than I do. And I wrote a book on multifamily, I wrote a book on self-storage, um, and I have a free special report on mobile home park investing that I'm about to release. So you can contact me for that. Uh, Isaac, what route would you go in Phoenix, apartment or storage? Um, I would try to get a fragmented or a mom and pop owned storage unit, hands down. However, I will tell you that in there's a lot of new jobs coming into Phoenix. There's a certain area of Phoenix, I can't remember where, but there's thousands, maybe over 10,000 new jobs coming. Mm. May wanna consider that. Um, uh, if you can find apartments or storage near there. Someone says, how much do you charge for your mentoring group? You can reach out to me um, uh, on my Bigger Pockets profile. Thanks for asking, Abinia. Um, Kyle says, if I'm not accredited but have a HELOC for 60000 good. How should I put that money to work? Try to find a deal that you don't have to be accredited for. I know two or three myself, and um, I recommend that you consider that. Thanks, Scott. I love my lamp, too. I got that in Marietta, Georgia. Cody says, how would you approach the owner of an off-market multifamily property? Cody, uh, try to get in front of them, try to buy them lunch, write them a handwritten letter. Do not, um, don't write them a typed letter or a postcard or reach out to them through email. You probably wouldn't know their email anyway, right? Um, <laughs> Jana says, does your mentor program have a price and do you need prerequisites? Uh, Janice, feel free to reach out to me. We can chat all about that offline because I'm really not like really supposed to be doing a lot of advertising here, but I am trying to answer questions. Um, Scott says, what do you think about investing in off-campus student housing? Yeah, I, you know, Scott, I think mean, it's pretty good. My one fear with that is Liberty University, which is, right down the road from me has like, what, 16,000 students on campus and all these beautiful dorms and off-campus students, but they have 100,000 students online. If that's the trend over decades, if more and more people are gonna go online, I wonder if student housing could fall out of favor someday. My money would be on senior housing if you're gonna do a niche, and you can see why. Students don't have to have a place to live on or off campus, but seniors do need a place to live, and seniors are living longer and longer every year, as you know. Christopher says, do you have any advice on how to underwrite a deal to see how good of a deal it is for that neighborhood? Yeah, join Bigger Pockets Pro, Christopher, and get the Neighborhood Scout program. Neighborhood Scout is a great tool, and you can get a discount on it if you join Bigger Pockets Pro. Uh, Neighborhood Scout has all kinds of data to help you scout out a neighborhood. And as far as underwriting, you're probably going to need to find a mentor. And I'm not talking about me now. I'm talking about like an apartment mentor, like, you know, someone like Joe Fairless or uh, I'm drawing a blank, 37th Parallel who did my mentoring and others. They will teach you how to underwrite a deal. 
Um, uh, Good Egg Investments, we mentioned already today, they're doing some training coming up here in the near future as well. Cody Elliott says, oh, I'm sorry, Mark says, if you had 80,000 in cash and a HELOC for 130,000, what would you do? So if I had 210,000, Mark, I would split it up if I could among four investments at 52,500 each. Um, I would try to spread my money out if you're accredited. Even if you're not accredited, I would do the same thing, Mark. I would not put it all with any one investor, not with any one syndicator, I should say, or any one fund. Even though I love having people invest with us, I don't really recommend that anybody put all their money in one place. That's why we diversify in the first place as a fund. But I think you should go ahead and diversify among funds and operators as well to even be more safe. Jordan says, should you use a property manager for small multifamily investment? Jordan, if you don't, you might be crazy in a short time. Uh, managing properties can make people nuts. And if you have the temperament for it, check, check out the... Um, uh, some of the personality profiles and things. If you have the temperament for it, you might be able to pull it off. It's really, really hard. Folks, you know, one way to manage property is not pay a property manager 10%, but you basically say, look, I'll put the tenants in, I'll screen them, I'll take the deposits, and then I'll turn them over to you, Mr. or Mrs. Property Manager, and you can possibly get them to do that for 5% instead of 10. It's kind of a nice mix. You do a concentrated burst of effort up front, then you turn it over to the property manager for the long haul. Um, Imad says, what do you think of commercial real estate like a gas station? Do you think the whole uh, gasoline industry will re be replaced with electric cars in 30 years? Yeah, you know, that's a great point. I don't really have an opinion on that. It's not something I invest in Imad, so I really probably shouldn't comment. By the way, if anybody else wants to comment like on Imad's question or anybody else, feel free. I don't have all the answers here. Uh, Janice, or you're welcome, Jordan. Uh, Janice says, how can a student with about 5,000 to spend start making passive income? Great question, Janice. Janice um, I would go to a crowdfunding site and try to find a crowdfunding opportunity where you can invest $5,000. Nathan Hui says, do you recommend house hacking to get started in real estate investing? I'm looking at a quad. Absolutely. I recommend house hacking. And if any of you don't know what that is, that means you live in a unit and you rent the others. The problem is you need to have a bad cop. Make sure, Nathan, that you have a bad cop. Somebody in your life who's holding you accountable so you can go to those tenants. In fact, it'd be great if your tenants don't even know you're the owner. You're just another guy in unit C, right? Uh, okay, so that's just my advice on that. But yeah, I recommend house hacking. Have a bad cop or don't even tell them you're the owner better yet. Um, Mike says, if you had 130000 one to get into commercial, would you have enough or would you have to partner? Mike, you probably have to partner with 130000 You might be able to buy a fiveplex, which is the smallest um, multi-family unit. If you wanted to get into self-storage or mobile home park with 130000 down, you'd probably be a little bit on the small side and maybe you'd have to end up managing it yourself, which, like I said, can drive you crazy. Trust me. Okay, Jared says, I have a couple large storage buildings in my yard, 3,500 square feet. Do I need an LLC for boat storage? Yeah, Jared, I, I think you should have an LLC. Um, check with Scott Smith, Royal Scott Smith. He wrote an article. He's written articles in Bigger Pockets. Scott Royal Smith, and he can talk about asset management and all of that stuff. Um, but yeah, I would think you would. And I, yeah, that's a great use for your 3,500 square foot um, facility. You might be able to park some boats outside as well. You might need a business license though. Okay, we're getting into the fire round. <clears throat> I didn't do that as well as... Brandon does, but we're down to the last nine or 10 minutes. So I'm going to be answering these questions really incompletely and incompetently, <laughs> seriously, pretty fast here. So Angel says, I have a full-time job and do real estate on the side buy and hold. I want to go into real estate full-time. I want to get into real estate, but I want to get a HELOC, which is a home equity line of credit folks. First, should I go full-time and do the HELOC later? 
or get the HELOC, then quit my job. Uh, Angel, the most people would say, get your HELOC first and make big changes second. You should run that by your banker to be sure that they're okay with that. Uh, Dodd says, where do I start to invest in senior living real estate? There are some syndicators out there and some funds that are investing in senior living. I don't have any I can recommend. We're researching at Wellings Capital for the possibility of doing that in the future. Your baby's daddy says, I have 200,000 liquid to invest. Should I buy a multifamily or purchase a couple condos in Las Vegas? You know, Las Vegas, Las Vegas has been really, really high and really, really low in the past. And a lot of people have lost money there. A lot of people have quadrupled their money there. Um, consider reading the book how, by Howard Marks called Mastering the Market Cycle, Getting the Odds in Your Favor. Um, Howard Marks talks about when to invest in places like Las Vegas. And honestly, I would kind of think not right now would not be the best time. That's my opinion. Jana says, what would you say housing for the disabled is a good, would you say it's a good investment? Yes, I would. Uh, but you know, again, you got to get the right deal in the right market and all that. Uh, Howard says, if you had half a million dollars, what would you invest in? Philadelphia, Jersey. Uh, I would actually go out and find somebody who's investing in storage. And again, this is what I would do and because this is exactly what I am doing. So I'm being super honest here, Howard. I would certainly go out and find somebody and diversify your money across self-storage, mobile home parks, and perhaps some uh, very conservative multifamily. That's what I would do, Howard. Gianna Moore says, if you have 350000 in equity, what's a good way to invest in real estate? Gianna, again, like just like I said to Howard, I'd recommend that you consider being passive, like doing a ton of research on the syndicator sponsor, whether they're through a crowdfunding site or whoever you get. But after you do that research, I would invest with them passively. That's what I'd recommend. That's again, that's what I'm doing myself. Tony says, is it is wholesale a good way to get into real estate with under 3000 to invest? Yes, it is. And you may also want to consider a lease option sandwich. I'm so sorry, I don't have time to explain what that is, but yes, wholesaling is a lot of work. I mean, a lot of work, and you're competing against the big boys, but drive around and try to find your own deals, and you might be able to get one, or try to get one off the courthouse steps. My friend in Roanoke, Virginia, the other day went to the courthouse steps, and a $200,000 plus nice home just sold for 117,000 with only one bidder. Wow. Scott says pick the pick first pick the first area you think of as a great place to do single family homes in a good school district. Somewhere in the southern smile, Scott, somewhere between you know like Charleston, South Carolina, down through Alabama, Georgia, Texas, Nevada, up to like Nevada, I would avoid California. Actually, I wouldn't even do a Nevada, but uh, what do you think about Austin? I think it's great. What do you think about Charlotte? I think it's great. Reginald, it's a great, great city. Austin's growing, Charles, but man, it is really heated up. I've been avoiding Austin for a while. Miguel, but my friends at, um, uh, there's a, a company there that's doing great in, in Austin and, you know, it could be great. Miguel says, if someone could go to college for free, would you say they should get a bachelor's degree and get out debt free or hustle, just side hustle multiple jobs? Miguel, if you can get a free college education, man, you're here on bigger pockets. I would recommend that you consider um, trying to get a degree in real estate. Uh, Gary Keller, the most famous real estate broker in history, got a degree in real estate and lots of others have as well. So yeah, that's what I would do. Thanks, Scott. That's nice of you. Abraham says, I'm interested in commercial properties and especially multifamily. Me and my wife own a number of them. That's great, Abraham. It's awesome. Um, get Steve Burgess's book, uh, The Complete Guide to Buying and Selling Apartment Buildings. Uh, like I said before, it's better than my book, which is uh, the perfect investment, but both are pretty helpful. Bigger Pockets is going to come out with a new book on multifamily investing soon. So 
Um, we've got five minutes left. If you've got one last quick question, fire it off now, folks. Okay. Mike says, I have an opportunity to buy a 42-unit apartment near a college, but it's all one bedroom, one bath. Should I run or look into it? 11.6% cap rate. Mike, there's an article today, and I don't... Oh, it's in National Real Estate Investor. NREI came out today. It talks about how smaller apartments are renting better than larger right now. So, man, if it's true, legitimate at 11.6% cap rate, and it's not a C- minus or D property, man, yeah, I would consider that. Janice Sutton, any other YouTube channels I recommend? Uh, I would recommend a lot of podcasts, Janice. I'm, uh, I have a podcast called How to Lose Money. It's a wealth building podcast, but there are other real estate podcasts that are more focused on real estate than mine, and I recommend that you do that. Jared says, who would you recommend I contact for a business license for boat rental? Check with your local city or county. Uh, there's an office that gives out business licenses. You can just call them. Uh, Nisi Knight Clay says, aside from housing, what's a major need for seniors? Oh, you got me. I don't know. Um, I'd like to uh, get somebody else to answer that. I'm sorry, Nietzsche. Um, Abraham Condos. Yeah, I think it would be a great idea to be a member of Bigger Pockets. Bigger Pockets Pro, I always think that's a good idea. If you're interested in constructing condos, that's a great idea. Flipping homes, a bad idea. No, it's a great idea, but it's harder than it used to be, DBS. Where are the best places to find mobile home parks for sale? There are like five major websites, and there are actually a hundred, right at about a hundred brokers nationwide that do mobile home parks. Uh, you can check out the Bigger Pockets podcast from I think it was July 4th, where they interviewed a guy about mobile home park investing, a guy named Frank Rolf. Uh, Justin Hilton says, I have an opportunity to purchase some land. Owner finance in a rural area and add some mobile homes. Justin, uh, I would not own a single mobile home ever because I've owned four of them in the past and three of the four turned out to absolute disasters. I hate to burst your bubble, my friend. Reach out to me and I can explain more. Frank Rolf, the guy on the Bigger Pockets podcast, said the same thing. He's the fifth largest in mobile home, mobile home park owner in the U.S., and he says never, never own a mobile home if you can help it. I just read his book. Trey says, is wholesaling still a good start? Yes, it is. Jeremiah, what seniors need? Uh, flipping homes, best places to find, okay. Better to invest in multifamily or single family homes. If you can get a good deal, go with multifamily. Tico says, what do you think about Airbnb? I think corporate rentals and Airbnb arbitrage is a great idea. I have a friend, uh, not a friend, somebody emailed me recently who said, thank you, thank you, Paul, because of you, I... Uh, uh, making, I think they were said 7,000 or 17,000 a month, him and his buddy, because I gave them an idea on how to do corporate uh, rentals and Airbnb. And I can give you the same information if you reach out to me on Bigger Pockets. Um, it's called Corporate uh, Rentals or Airbnb Arbitrage. You can learn more about it by reaching out to me. Howard says, What's the best crowdfunding? Thank you, Abraham. Thanks, Perry. You guys are awesome. Thanks, Justin. Please give us a thumbs up, a like, or a share. Uh, we'd really appreciate that. Thanks, Patrick. So sweet of you. Um, uh, what's the best crowdfunding site? So Fundrise, Realty Mogul. Um, one of them just went bankrupt recently, or, or they're, went, they're about to. Realty Shares. or something. Whoops, You know, I shouldn't say it. I don't know which one. Check it out yourself. But um, I really like um, CrowdStreet. CrowdStreet is awesome. And uh, I would definitely invest with deals on CrowdStreet. Uh, Nietzsche says, thanks for the insight. And then I didn't answer your question, Nietzsche. Sorry. Fikri says, health service. Okay. So Fikri says, health services, Nietzsche. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, what about using the 200000 to put 40000 down on four townhomes valued at one twenty, then refinance after six months? Yeah. If they're appreciating your baby's daddy. Uh, yeah, I would consider doing that. Uh, I would definitely consider it. Okay, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Fickery. Thanks, Howard. Okay, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much. I had a great time. 
uh, and I hope you did too. Hey, check out the Bigger Pockets Pro membership. Check out the Bigger Pockets uh, annual conference in Nashville, October 6th through 8th. And I hope to see you all again. If you enjoyed this, please give us a thumbs up, a like, or a share. And let Bigger Pockets know that you want to see more of this type of information. To close out, we're going to go with Charles here who says, put a cell tower on that land. Yes, Charles, I love that idea. And I would do it myself. Someday I'll tell you how I tried. Anyway, take care, you guys. Have a great day. And we'll see you next time here at Bigger Pockets.